everybody, how's it going? We're going to jump into some control of eukaryotic genes. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes um, control their uh, uh, protein synthesis in different ways. So uh, we're going to talk about eukaryotes today for the most part. So basically this is how do they turn things on and off? How are some genes uh, used pretty much all the time and how are other genes maybe only used once or twice and then shut down Permanently, there's there's actually several different ways this can happen. So uh, we will get into some details here in a minute. But it also allows genes to then, you know, perform really specialized things, right? And make cells really specialized in what they do. Because not every cell will actually turn on all the same things. So uh, for prokaryotes, right, not the one we're really going to spend time on today, they are single-celled. They evolve to grow and divide very rapidly, and they have to respond to very uh, quick changes, right? If you're a bacteria, your environment probably changes very rapidly. You're around a food source, you're not around a food source, temperature changes, all sorts of stuff. Um, they're very transient, right? So they have to cap, be able to capitalize very quickly. Um, and so they actually have this system of things called operons, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, but it allows them anyway. The back, the idea here is that they are adjusting very quickly. They're flexible, um, and they can turn things on and off super fast. So for eukaryotes, um, for eukaryotes, it's usually a little, um, a little different, right? We are generally bigger organisms, um, and we're looking to maintain homeostasis, and we're kind of looking to stay in these certain ranges, and so really it's all about like regulation, okay, and keeping things more consistent, right, more constant, uh, versus like all the like peaks and valleys that prokaryotes would have to go through. So uh, when we look at some of these things, you know, as I mentioned, we try to maintain homeostasis, we regulate the body as a whole, Growth and development is a very long-term process, right? And so uh, sometimes you have genes that are turned on, you know, when you're a baby and you need uh, different functions happening as far as your growth and development. And then once you get to a certain maturity, a certain age, a certain size, those genes get shut down permanently um, and will, will never come back on. So lots of different ways, like I mentioned, for things to be specialized and genes to get turned on and off. But eukaryotes are trying to coordinate them as a whole, right? We have lots of different parts and organs and cells and stuff that all have to work together, okay? So need a lot more coordination. So there are about seven points of control here that we're going to look at. <coughs> so the packing and unpacking of DNA, transcription, mRNA processing, mRNA transport, translation, and protein processing and protein degradation. So we've talked about a lot of these already. Uh, some of them I will be able to just kind of say, yeah, we talked about that. Others we haven't really talked about, and we'll go through them in a little bit more detail. So as far as the first one goes with DNA packing, some of this we've talked about um, in the past. You guys know how they coil, right? You have the double helix. They coil around um, histone proteins, and they make nucleosomes. Then those nucleosome uh, beads and the fiber start coiling, and they make what's called that uh, 30 nanometer fiber, which is about right here in this process. Once all the nucleosomes have really kind of started coiling together like this, okay? And so that's your 30 nanometer fiber, and then you're going to get these loop domains, so on and so forth, and we end up with a chromosome, right? When that's like super tight and super packed. Whoa. Um, so that's kind of how the regular packing gets done. Um, and just as reminder, right, the beads on a string, these are our nucleosomes where the DNA is wrapped around those histones. Um, and if you didn't remember, um, here are, you know, I'll put dots here, like all these little sections are all different histones. So there's generally about eight histones. We can't see the ones on the other side of this cartoon here. Um, and so histones are the proteins, and then the whole thing, the DNA and the protein, is a nucleosome, right? And so notice that the histone proteins are positively charged, right? And DNA is negatively charged. So then they uh, really like to bind together, right? The positive and the negative. That's what's holding them together. Oops. So, one second. Okay. So 
um, the degree of the packing and how tightly it's wrapped is going to control whether transcription is going to be turned on or off. If DNA is coiled like super tight, right, then transcription factors can't get in there uh, to bind to the DNA and to give the polymerase a starting point. So it would be turned off. If DNA is coiled up super tight, then it would be turned off. Okay, so we have these two terms here, heterochromatin, uh, which is the tightly packed, and euchromatin, which is more loosely packed, right? So heterochromatin is tight and euchromatin is loosely packed. And you can actually kind of tell this in this picture. Wherever you see the really dark sections, like here and here and here, that means the DNA is packed really tightly uh, because light in the microscope is not coming through there, so it's really dense. And so those areas are heterochromatin. The real light areas you see all throughout here is the euchromatin. And it's more loosely packed and it's more like chromatin um, instead of really tightly wrapped uh, DNA. So we also have this thing called methylation. And that's just adding methyl groups. Uh, sometimes methyl groups will attach to the C's, to the cysteine groups, to the cysteine groups. Um, Right here, you have um, a methyl group that's being added uh, to a cytosine. And whenever you get a lot of methyl groups together, it also causes them to coil up super tight, and it will not allow transcription to happen. So methylation equals no transcription, right? And this is what happens in bar bodies. We've talked about bar bodies when we talked about um, having the extra X chromosomes, like in the... Um, um, in the female and also in some of those um, uh, disorders we talked about um, back a couple chapters ago in the Mendelian uh, genetics. And so um, they get inactivated by methylation, by having these methyl groups put on there. And then the DNA gets coiled up so tight that transcription cannot take place. So no transcription, no mRNA, no mRNA, no protein, right? And then we do have the opposite of that we have what's called acetylation and acetylation is going to unwind dna so when these acetyl groups come and attach to dna that makes them way more relaxed and open so rather than being all coiled and tight they start opening up and they become available for transcription again okay so methylation no transcription acetylation you will get transcription Number two, talk about transcription in general here. So we've talked about the promoter, right? We never really talked much about the enhancer. I know it was in one of the diagrams um, uh, in that set of notes, but I never really talked about it a lot. The enhancer is more for regulation, for how fast transcription needs to happen. Um, it's a distant control, meaning it's a little further away. So uh, distant control. So here's your enhancer sequence right here. And the promoter, okay, which actually has the TATA -ta box, right? The TATA, -T -A, that's way down here. Okay, so that's in this section here in the promoter. And then the gene we're actually going to code is down here, okay, from this line forward. And the enhancer is way back here. So it's a distance control. And sometimes you have things called like activators and they grab the enhancer and then they squish the DNA like this and bring it closer so that the enhancer and the promoter actually end up in the same place, and then you get transcription, okay? You can actually get transcription uh, at an enhanced rate, at a much higher level. It's an enhancer, so it's gonna make it happen faster. So rather than just maybe cranking out one mRNA, this is gonna keep cranking out a bunch of mRNAs so that we can um, react to something very needed and very timely. So here are enhancer sequences, distant controls, activator proteins used to bind the enhancer to stimulate transcription. And there are things called silencers, which are used to block, uh, bind to the enhancer and block transcription. So you can do that as well. And you'll notice here that instead of it squishing it, instead of just squishing the DNA kind of horizontally, in this case, it flips it all the way over. And so down here in this picture, you can see how the enhancer is now brought to the promoter, and then all of the transcription factors that are needed uh, come to the area as well. And that is what is going to attract the RNA polymerase. And that is going to then kick off 
uh, transcription and making the mRNA. Okay, so the enhancer is really there to make things happen faster uh, if we need them to. Okay, this is a picture. You do not need to know any of these particulars in this picture. I just kind of like showing you, like, um, sometimes I like showing you what's coming down the road for you guys that may go into biology or biochemistry in college. And, you know, every level, like, you know, AP bio is obviously a lot more than regular bio. But when you get to college, there's even more, um, even more detail uh, that you'll get into and really figure out how things work. And then there's grad school beyond that and PhD. So there's really a lot more levels to all of this stuff as you get there. I just kind of want to blow this one part up to show you like really how many little parts there are that go into this. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Number three, post-transcriptional control. Also what you guys know is splicing. Right. So we have splicing and alternative splicing um, to where we can get different products um, depending on which exons are combined and which ones aren't. Right. We can get different mRNA and that will create different proteins. And that's a form of control as well. Right. Where you're kind of choosing or dictating what's getting made and what's not. It's not all the same thing. So. Um, so splicing and alternative splicing is going to give us uh, lots of different options, right? So from one mRNA, we can get a lot of different proteins and that's control. That's being able to figure out what's kind of going to get turned into a protein and what's not. Number four, regulation of the mRNA degradation. This is just really about lifespan and that has to do with our caps and tails. Okay, so the lifespan of an mRNA gets determined a lot by the caps and tails and how uh, how they're attached and how like long the poly A tail is. And mRNA can last from hours to weeks. So if it's still viable, then ribosomes are going to keep getting onto that mRNA and going to keep cranking out um, uh, proteins. Okay, so a couple things you guys already knew, but maybe didn't know it had a real regulation side to it. Now we get to one that we have not talked about yet, and it's called RNAi, RNA interference, okay? And we have these things called siRNAs, and I told you we would learn some more letters about RNA, more than just mRNA and tRNA and rRNA. So siRNA is one of those, um, small interfering RNAs. And so uh, basically what these do um, is, you have these small interfering RNAs, these short segments of RNA, only 21 to 28 bases, um, and they will bind to mRNA. They will bind to a good mRNA, and then that creates a section of double-stranded RNA. And I know, um, you know you're kind of taught to think that, oh, mRNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. Well, there can be instances where they do have double-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA um, in certain instances. So when you add, when you have this double-stranded RNA here, it actually becomes like a little death tag, and it's going to trigger the degradation of that mRNA. So this is what we call gene silencing. You may have heard of gene silencing before. Um, it is a post-transcriptional control, and I'm going to show you another slide here in a minute and give you more details, but it's a post-transcriptional, meaning after transcription, right? The mRNA has been made. It's going out into the cytoplasm to find a ribosome, but now, like, it's kind of like somebody changing their mind. Uh, you um, you ordered chicken at dinner, and the waiter walked away, and then when they come back by, you're like, oh, wait, can I change that to steak? I'd rather have steak instead of chicken, right? So the cell made an mRNA, and then conditions changed. Um, the circumstances changed, and I don't need that protein anymore, so I want to recall that protein I want, or I, that mRNA. I want to make sure that the mRNA that I just made does not turn into a protein. So you have to find a way of recalling that or degrading that. And that's what gene silencing is, okay? So you turn, um, if you turn the gene off, right, then there's no protein, there's no gene expression, right? And for this case, the same thing, if you shut down the mRNA, that's basically the same thing as shutting down the gene because you're not gonna get any protein. So let's move on to the next picture. I'll kind of show you how this works. So here's our mRNA coming off at the top. Okay. And sometimes mRNA will fold back on itself and um, 
you know, it doesn't look right, right? There's these hairpin loops you can see up here. Okay, there's these hairpin loops up here. And when this particular enzyme called dicer sees this, right? It's kind of a kind of the right name for this, right? Because it's going to dice it up. Dicer will take this and it will um, it will end up. Come on, clicker! Oh, I gotta get rid of my pen. It will end up chopping up some of these um, double stranded mRNAs and it will turn them into these little single stranded these little small interfering rnas will end up being here some of these small interfering rnas then will attach to an rn to an mrna that's supposed to be translated so you can see in this particular one right here now it has a couple of double stranded sections and that is going to be the tag that is going to be what gets recognized as that's not normal. We don't want that. We want to chop that up. Okay. So what happens is there's a complex called RISC. RISC stands for RNA induced silencing complex. RNA induced silencing complex. RISC, which is shown in the cartoon here by this purple blob. Okay. RISC is this enzyme complex. It recognizes the double strandedness of this, and it will now break it down and chew it up. It will degrade the mRNA. Okay, so we get some mRNA here. We have these other dicer makes us some siRNAs. The siRNAs will now um, bind via complementary base pairing. They will bind to this other part that needs to get degraded. Risk will recognize that, and it will basically paper shred that mRNA, and now it's degraded and it will not do its job anymore, okay? So, um, yeah, it functionally turns the gene off, right? So you can even, you can transcribe the gene, you can make an mRNA, but if the mRNA uh, doesn't ever get to a ribosome, was there ever really an RNA, okay? So uh, the gene will functionally be turned off because you will not get the protein, no gene expression. Five, control of translation. This says block the initiation stage of translation. All this one is, is a roadblock, okay? This is like virtually, oops, this is virtually a roadblock. So regulatory proteins attach to the five prime end of the mRNA, and it prevents attachment of the ribosomal subunits. So here is the five prime end, and it doesn't do a great job showing you this because in this next picture, it shows how the large and small are together. But what this thing will do is it will put a regulatory protein right here on the five prime end, and I'll just draw one in. And now there's basically a roadblock there that will not allow the large subunit on. It won't fit, and so it can't go on there, and thus the ribosome subunits won't join. And so now we have no translation. And again, we will have no protein, right? We have the mRNA, the mRNA is fine, but we can't translate it. We can't make the protein. The ribosome subunits can't get on there. So this one is literally just kind of a physical roadblock. There is a, um, uh, an inhibitor sitting on there blocking translation from happening. Six and seven. Protein processing and degradation, okay? So um, when proteins are finally made, there is folding and cleaving and things that are added to it and it's targeted for transport. And, you know, we've talked about how proteins get modified once they're made, right? Well, again, maybe something changed and you even made the protein. It made it all the way through and you made it, but now you don't want that protein to be active because things have changed. And so now we need to, again, tag it to be destroyed. And this tag in particular is called ubiquitin, okay? Ubiquitin right here uh, is going to be added to this protein, and that is the death tag. So whenever cells see ubiquitin added to a protein, it will be sent um, over here to something called uh, the proteasome, and it kind of looks like this. Um, kind of looks like a rattlesnake, right? Like this um, end of a snake or a python that coils around it. And what it does, the proteasome, is really just a shredder. 
wood chipper, garbage disposal, shredder, whatever, and they shred up the proteins. They shred up those polypeptides. So um, should be another little bit more on this. So the death tag or the ubiquitin was discovered um, by these guys here. Um, and it it marks the unwanted protein for the label. It's about seven, uh, ubiquitin is about 76 amino acids uh, long itself. I know it just showed three little blobs there, but there's 76 amino acids that make up this polypeptide. Uh, and once it's labeled for that, then it gets rapidly uh, disposed of by the proteasome, okay, by the wood chipper. Okay, so the wood chipper and the garbage disposal is the proteasome um, that looks like this over here a little bit. And so move my face down here. So protein, proteasome, the protein degrading machine, uh, cells waste disposer, it breaks down any proteins into seven to nine amino acid fragments, right? So really small amino acid fragments, which will probably uh, in all likelihood get recycled, right? The amino acids will get recycled and used uh, somewhere else to build other proteins. And so it is a it is a cellular recycling mechanism. So here's our protein with our ubiquitin. So we know we don't need this one. And so the protein gets uh, weaved through here and it goes through the proteasome and it goes in a full protein and it comes out confetti. Okay. And so seven to nine amino acid long uh, pieces of confetti uh, after it goes through there. And so that protein will clearly not be doing its job. So it's just another way to silence things um, and, and shut things down, turn things off, okay? So you can click through all of these uh, pictures. I will be putting the, um, oops, I will be putting this up for you guys to look at. So there's kind of all of them kind of by location and by the order in which they happen throughout the process. So good little study tool. And I did put a little blank slide back here uh, for you guys to try to maybe use that as a review tool. So hope that was helpful. And that's how you carry out to do it. And we will check out uh, the operons and how prokaryotes do that on Wednesday. All right. Take care. Talk to you later.